Previously, we've covered the Spanish-made ruby pistol and cloned swing-out cylinder revolvers. But before any of that, they were copying a Smith & Wesson big bore double action. One that would still work its way into the war. Hi, I'm Othias, and this is the British Contract Spanish Made Revolver Old Pattern Number 1 Mark 1. Can you remember all of that? Good, let's take it over the light box. Weighing in at over 2 pounds and with an overall length of 10 inches, this is a hefty, chunky 6 shot 455 revolver using a very familiar top brake action. Now, before we go any further, I want to say something very clearly. These guns are almost impossible to name. Now, the Spanish clones, they had trade names, and we'll talk about that in a moment. The American design Smith & Wesson that preceded them also had its own name and names, actually. None of them is stuck. They, they, when I say Smith & Wesson number three, boom, you know. When I say Colt New Army, boom, you know. When I say... Smith & Wesson first model double action, that does not always stick for people. And when I say the Ona, nobody knows what I'm talking about. So hopefully this episode will enlighten a fair few of you, although I don't think it's going to be any easier to search for one of these things online because every time you type in double action, you just get every Smith & Wesson made in the past hundred years. Welcome to my personal heck. Now, whining aside, we've got a little history to cover because these guns go way back before World War I. Recall from our last episode that Smith and Wesson started a business, and it failed, so they sold out and started another one. That one did much better. They produced two models of tip-up revolver. And then, as the Roland White patent that protected their bore through cylinder expired, they invested in a technologically advanced number three model. Thanks to a contract with Russia, this evolved into the number three Russian with a first, second, and third model. Following those contracts, there would be a commercial new model. Also, somewhere in that mix was the Schofield, but that doesn't play a role and we haven't covered it. So yeah, the latest in Smith & Wesson technology going into 1879 was this guy right here. A single action improved model. Uh, without the, but we covered that. Uh, that's the best you got. That is not cutting edge anymore. And by the way, at that time in history, Smith & Wesson was cutting edge. They wanted to be at the forefront of arms technology or handgun technology. Unfortunately, they had no double action. Instead, this was a concept that was very popular in Europe, catching on very well and even being adopted militarily by 1879, but it just wasn't sticking in America. Guns like the Chamlot, Gasser, and the Gaunt were working their way into military adoption on the continent, and they were proving to be less wasteful and more useful than many bullet counters expected. And so Colt would finally get on the game in 1877, and while this and the Model 1878 weren't perfect, they were a step into what would be the future. So Smith & Wesson needed to respond. Alright, I'm being a little misleading by saying respond, because Smith & Wesson actually considered a double action all the way back until at least 1872, when there's at least one letter known to have been sent from Smith & Wesson to the Russians, talking about some sort of, it's like a mid-conversation uh, piece of whatever that we don't know everything about. But apparently the Russians were considering a 20,000 unit order for a highly modified number three in double action. This didn't actually go anywhere. The price would have been very comparable to the existing contract because it was looking at something around $15 a pop. That's all we know. Now, a few years later, however, we're going to get a glimpse thanks to a Smith & Wesson employee named Bullard. See, this is one of James H. Bullard's sketches. He was an arms designer and master mechanic for Smith & Wesson. He had been involved in the number three and was now put towards double action designs. The sketch dates from 1876 and exhibits many of the features that would later enter production. All right, big story shrunk. Somewhere around the middle of 1879, Bullard had worked out a five shot, five shot, 32 caliber uh, single and double action revolver. And then in October, he had worked up a 38 caliber version of the same. Now these were, I mean, they were based on the number three, but heavily modified. However, they were ready to roll, and so in January of 1880, they would be offered 
in the catalog. And I shouldn't say they. The first one was the 38, and then shortly after you'd see the 32. This became the Smith & Wesson number two double action. I am so not getting into their naming convention at this point, I'm confused. This was a five shot 38 caliber single and double action revolver. Note that there is a double set of cylinder stop notches along with some extra travel grooves. This is because the early cylinder stop used a rocking motion. I actually won't be getting deep into the mechanics of that because it was abandoned by the time we got to our Spanish clone. Uh, I do, however, have one of the later 32s right here. Now this one does not have a double set of notches because this one has the improved cylinder stop. Let's go ahead and just briefly take a closer look so you know what we're talking about and what Smith & Wesson is putting out. So this is itty bitty. Top break, pop open, there we go, five shot. Uh, again, this uses that same pull up, pull out, and twist oop, of the new model that we saw before, and we'll see it again in a moment. So that's why that was important last episode. Center fire. Uh, and there's going to be some improvements in terms of these plates, and then like I said with the stop notches, other little things that I am not going to go into deep detail. But the important bit is A, these are small consumer pocket-ish style handguns, I mean, look at that thing. And B, it has single and double action. And yes, I assure you this is a real gun, it's just very, very tiny compared to everything we've been seeing lately. Alright, so... These guys are in place. That's beautiful. And they're selling very well commercially, this and the 38. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're selling so well that these are very easy to find nowadays in the US collector's market. Uh, not always easy to get the ammo though. That's all well and good, but we're sort of a military channel, right? So this thing's got to get 86 from our point of view. And we need to talk about something martial. So when does the big bore come back? Because at that time, you know, 1880, 1881, we're looking for big, dumb, slow, hard-hitting cartridges. That's what the military wants. And so, like I said, 1881, that's when they dropped the bomb. Chambering the 44 Russian cartridge, this would be the first model double action. I assume that's because it's the first 44 caliber double action model, because it's not the first double action model for Smith & West. Guys, these names. Again, this was alternatively marketed as the new model Navy number no. three, thanks to some Russian trialing that ultimately led nowhere. Now I'm lucky enough to have an example right here. So let me move this guy aside for a second. Uh, gently, there we go. And let's take a closer look at what Smith & Wesson was putting out as their next military revolver. Ooh, that is a big honkin' boy. Now remember, this is coming fresh off of the new model number three. So I'm gonna pull one out. Well, look at that. Now, again, the big difference here is the ability to fire double action. Fantastic. And again, notice that this particular one, let me get my patented plastic pokey hand, has the grooves and double cylinder stops. That is because this gun never really sold well enough to get past the need to sort of upgrade the model. They were waiting on a military contract before they made any real improvements. They never really got one. So uh, our rocker style cylinder stop, we're not going into deep de detail there. Uh, but the thing that really stands out about this gun is number one, the changes from the number three. So in this case, we go from this sort of chunkier grip to a much thinner rocker style grip. And we have this inlet for the back of your fingers. You have plenty of room there. It's frankly much more ergonomically comfortable than you would think. This looks very awkward. It feels pretty good. And this grip would actually carry over into the K-Frame series. It's the sort of de facto K-Frame grip with the bell that we're used to militarily as being the optional one until much later on in the series when it became more popular. So excellent new grip, excellent new ergonomics. And then uh, when it comes to the break open and ejection and the cylinder retention, which again, we push, push up on that and rotate this guy out to get her out. Uh, that is all actually directly from the new model, uh, so much so that they were interchangeable right at the beginning, except of course for the modifications to the cylinder stop. So if I get, and this is gonna be awkward, get both of these guys in here, I mean, that's that's the same component. I mean, that's all the same milling, easy savings, easy tooling, wonderful setup. All right, so uh, I got a lot of guns to deal with. Like I said, this guy only realistically produced about 70,000 models, all those being commercial sales. Uh, not a huge game changer for Smith & Wesson, despite, you know, fairly revolutionary at the time. And by the way, this is not a bad single and double action for being an early one. It's actually quite more robust than you would expect. 
really, really underrated design from Smith & Wesson. It's still not all that well remembered now today. There is only one real variant of this gun, which is the Frontier model. This sported a stretched out frame and cylinder so it could chamber the 4440 cartridge. Around 1900, with the introduction of a 3840 chambering, this would become the standard frame size for all production until it ended in 1913. Now, Russia, well they, let me clean up some of my mess. Russia, they would experiment with this, but they decided ultimately that they were fine with the single shot mentality like we said. They were okay with not wasting ammo. They didn't want somebody just taking one of these and blah, 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 and running out. And by the way, Russia would finally adopt the double action in a small bore. And part of that is the expectation that you want to have a very controllable cartridge if you're going to mix it with a very heavy double action trigger pull on a pistol. That sort of makes sense. A lot of people go that way. We could argue it back and forth. That's not really the topic for today. The short answer is this gun had almost no military career whatsoever, except when it came to the handy workmen over in the Ibar region of Spain. Ah yes, the hand-tooled gunsmithing paradise. Under Spanish law, you see, any patent must be produced domestically within three years, or they go up for grabs. Well that means by 1884, this gun was simplified and cloned in Spain, most notably by Orbea Hermanos. We've heard this name before in Spanish cloned pistols, but I want to make sure we get a little background this time. Juan Manuel, Mateo, and Casimiro Orbea founded their firm in 1860, manufacturing a clone of the then very popular La Fachot revolver. With the release of the number three single actions, the Hermanos would again set to copying, and the success of this model would marry them to emulating Smith & Wesson for years to come. So, like I said, when the new double action dropped, they just waited the three years and got to work all over again, branding theirs the Ona. But it was generally known as the Smith, due to variations of the pattern, the military version would be the number seven Smith. So the original is out, and the clone is in. Now here's something very interesting. Orbea internally in Spain was able to apply for 20 years of protection to make this their exclusive product. And so, in 1884 they would do so, making them the only producer of the first model double action copy. Uh, the Ona. Now, the Smith. This protection required a payment every year. Uh, by the way, in October of 1884, the Spanish government would authorize this by royal decree as being available for purchase by officers as long as it was in a standard chambering. Uh, the price to those officers was uh, 40 pesetas, and it proved to be a very popular design. It did not replace the official Lefa Show because they would actually try to go from the Lefa Show to an auto load. It's a whole thing. Spanish gun history is fantastic. But this was an officially recognized you could buy it and carry it if you're an officer pistol, and they did so in fairly large numbers. As a matter of fact, over the course of production for uh, the Spanish manufacturers, I think Orbea sold many more of these than Smith & Wesson, but we'll talk more about that in a moment. So Orbea is making a clone of the Smith & Wesson. They are making it under protection for quote unquote 20 years, but there's a fee every year. At some point, the yield is falling, there's newer designs in the market. And so in 1895, they would stop paying that protection money and boom, it goes on the market for everybody else to make. And a lot of other manufacturers would step in, two very notable ones for our case today. Both of these should be familiar to fans of the show. Karate Anitua and Trokaora Aranzabal. Both firms, of course, were involved in various pistol and revolver products, but we only care about one for this video series. And I have one of those guns right here. So let's go ahead and take a closer look and we'll go ahead and bring in the original just for good measure. So zooming in, this, oop, bonk. This is our Smith & Wesson original. Let me get where you guys can see that. Fancy. Now. Let's see if you can spot the difference, ready? One of these things is not like the other. One of these things is Spanish. All right, cool. There is our Spanish clone. Now, some of the most notable features to me, by the way, scale is dead on, the frame is dead on. I mean, this is a direct clone. There's just a couple things that are different in my mind that really stand out. One is they didn't bother doing the sort of underswept trigger guard. No bother there. And two, they still got a nice pinchy up here instead of this beautiful sort of swept lever position. Interesting thing about this 
is that realistically it emulates more like the 32s, but this is our gun. It works the same as the other one. We have a top break action, which is a little stiff. Oh, there we go. Top break action, simultaneous eject, pop, and then we can load. Uh, we can snap or, or we can release it the same way, push up here, rotate out, I'm not bothering now. And then when we pop her back down, we're locked tight. Uh, we have a single and a double action. And otherwise this is pretty unremarkable. Uh, there's not much else for me to talk about uh, because it's all right there in front of you, short of what we can turn over to Bruno for an animation because I'm not going any deeper on this thing until you guys get a good look. With the first look at this revolver, you're going to see that it is very different from our earlier drawing. That's because, yet again, the Spanish have simplified the design to ease it for manufacture. That makes this its own unique gun in many ways. Let's start by getting a good look at the ejection system. This tabbed wheel right here drives the plunger, but it's really controlled by this smaller lug. As we open the action, that lug holds things in place until pinched into the frame. That allows everything to snap back closed for loading. We'll start things off in single action by cocking the hammer. Now let's use our trigger directly for double action. You'll notice the cylinder stop only activates on the trigger pull, making it free spinning when at rest. This little lever actually serves as the hammer rebound. Otherwise, this should be a very familiar interaction of hand, cylinder, etc., bog standard for this show. As we'll unload, we'll again see that unique ejection system at work. And let's get it over to May. Well, the bullets went from here downrange. That's good. I don't know that we got much better performance than that. Although I will say this is a gun that was not designed to survive for a hundred years. Anyway, uh, we'll let May give her opinion on sort of how good of a gun this is later on. Anyway, this is either exciting or depressing depending on your perspective, but tens of thousands more of these things were sold than the original Smith & Wesson design. I... And by the way, that's because of the market, not necessarily because of quality or anything like that. Smith & Wesson was trying to sell to an American market and to some foreign militaries. The Spanish? Well, those guys were selling to anybody that would take them. And the good news is they were very popular in Europe and places like Africa and China and other parts of Asia. And so Spanish and later even Belgian manufacturers would clone the crap out of these things and send them everywhere. And people really liked them for being cheap, semi-reliable handguns in a nice big bore cartridge. And by the way, I haven't mentioned the chambering for these yet because it could be anything. Any big bore, realistically. They adopted them to a number of different cartridges, dealer's choice or buyer's choice, whatever you'd like. Now, that means because of a global marketing network and a low price, these radically, like I said, outsold the Smith & Wesson. So I'm really sorry, Mr. Smith and Mr. Wesson. Now, being a case of worldwide successfully marketed pirated design does not guarantee you a slot in a CNR Snow Primer episode. We're working through World War I right now, so that means it had to get into the conflict. How the heck did that happen? Because every other country already has a good double action design of some sort locked down long before we get to 1914. Well, they would come at the invitation 
of the British. See, they had this, the Webley revolver in 455, and it was dang nice, but Webley was the only supplier, and had been for decades. Now, Britain didn't consider the handgun to be absolutely instrumental, but they did want a good, powerful one. We talked about all this in the Webley episode. And as part of that, we also talked about the fact that Webley had sort of been slowly throttled uh, by British law. And so commercially, they were not doing so hot. They subsided on a trickle of military contracts. Now, that's well and good if your military needs a trickle of guns. But as we've learned, you want to have some base commercial uh, sponsored flexibility in your arms market so that when you do have a war you can draw on all of that expansion that was paid for by private purchases not in the middle of a war military trying to build more factories which by the way would happen for Webley they had shrunk down before the war and then well all of a sudden Britain found that they needed a bunch more guns because war were declared <laughs> That's right, guys, you legislated your domestic pistol manufacturer into a corner, and then you needed him to produce literally a million handguns. And they could not right away. They would have to radically expand, add machinery, add men. It was a scramble. And in that scramble, there was still lots of time for the British to lose whatever guns they did have, and they needed more desperately. And so they would have to turn to foreign suppliers. Now, the first of those would actually be America. That's right, both Colt and Smith & Wesson would produce some beautiful 455 revolvers for our friends across the pond. But these are getting their own episodes later. Now, even with American help, they were going to need more handguns. And it'd be best if they could get them in their standard cartridge. And they didn't have to be perfect. They could use them for rear echelon stuff and maybe on the front line here and there. Whatever could they do? Well, they took a page of the French book and they went over to Spain where they found the Ona already ready to go. And it's not all that different from the native British Webley. Let's take a quick look for comparison. Uh, the Webley, first and foremost, is a little chunkier with no backstop there, although by the time we're getting this deep, the Mark VI would come out, and we have a whole episode on that. You guys can get your opinions out there. But these were plenty serviceable for frontline duty, even with the swoop and the Mark IVs and Mark Vs. When you show it with this grip, where we do have a nice knuckle, it's a thinner grip. It feels much more comfortable to me, at least, and I think it shoots more comfortably. Well, that's not so bad. The only real downside, because they both chamber 455, they both simultaneously eject, they both can probably load from a Perdot loader. The only downside is that instead of this beautiful push and pop, you have to cross your hand over to get a good pinch or run your hand up higher off the grip, push high and pop. That's your big difference. It's not a huge deal. And these are cheap and readily available. Well, I say readily available, but there's a little bit of a hang up. These things are hand tooled and even the biggest firms are only putting out 20 or so a day and the British need tens of thousands. The other thing, that's really going on is the French are already putting weight on the biggest companies. So the companies that can produce more of these a day, they're already producing other stuff for the French. So you're going to have to sort of swarm a bunch of smaller groups together, get a bunch of... You don't have a milling machine that makes 150 of this part a day. You have dudes who run various milling machines that make 150 of these days. You need a lot more dudes when you work in Spain. In order to organize those dudes, and you're British, you don't speak Spanish, you don't understand the region, you've got to find a way to organize the ability to gather labor, teach labor, apply labor, and produce a reliable enough handgun out of that market, you're going to need local help. That help would be Orbea Hermanos, who would rope in both Karate Anitua and Trocaura, who seem to have worked as subcontractors, although completing whole guns for this process. The British asked them to produce a 10 inch long revolver with a 5 inch barrel and a weight under 34 ounces unloaded. They should also chamber that 455 Mark II cartridge. Just a reminder, this is the big and slow British man stopper cartridge from the Webley revolvers. And so an order was placed for this guy in 1915, and they were supposed to have 2400 of them by August 2nd, and this would gear up by about 1000 a month until they were expected in November to be delivering 8000 a month. I don't know it was supposed to track up higher than 8,000 or not, and reasonably it doesn't matter that much because 
contract didn't carry on for that much longer. But let's take a look at the models. Two separate patterns would be sealed. The pistol old pattern number one Mark I features a protruding metal tang and short plastic grips. All three companies would at times produce this pattern. The pistol old pattern number two Mark I features the same contour, but full wooden grips. It's worth noting that that one was only produced by Trocaola that we know of, and have not been found with true inspection marks. That's despite having a sealed pattern, being marked with plenty of commercial proofs, and being found in British inventory. Now it's curious that they didn't have dedicated inspection marks because that was part of the contract. All of them were supposed to go to Enfield, for final approval. And so that's where we start to run into a problem with these guns because by the beginning, like by December, January, December 1915, January 1916, already 6,000 of these had been rejected by the British as unsuitable for service. They were just walked too far out of the reasonable tolerances. And even the ones that were accepted, they're all hand fit, so none of the parts are interchangeable. This is turning into a bit of a bother for the British, and they're not super keen on it. Added to the fact that Webley was starting to catch back up finally, manufacturer was flowing, they got a rhythm. Maybe, you know, Smith & Wesson Colt stuff's actually showing up now in the mail. We checked our mailbox, it was there, and we got excited. Uh, maybe this isn't such a good idea. And so they would go ahead and tell the guys back in Spain that they were going to be done with this whole project by the end of July. That's it, none after that point. By that time, 29,558 had been delivered and accepted. We're unsure if this included the number twos from Trocaola, because as we said, they were generally not found with inspection marks. By the way, I said only Trocaola made these, but that's probably true. Some very few number twos have turned up in British inventories with no markings at all. These were likely from a later 500 pieces purchased from an importer named Rexac and Urgorti. Likely, they were bought from Chocala stock. So yeah, the British were not terribly impressed with these guns. And so, they didn't see a lot of frontline use. They were mostly relegated to guards and things like that. But we've seen a few pictures sneak in where, like in our intro for this whole episode, there were some guys actually packing some of these for heat. Now, ultimately, I can't find much in the way of a review. People did not seem to care enough about these to really report on any favorable or unfavorable impressions. I'm sure they did a decent utilitarian job. And at the time, by the way, you know, let's be honest. On video, you can probably see some hangs and snags. You can see that this is a little awkward. And I'm going to tell you that I've seen like five examples of these particular guns and getting one that runs and is still in time, it's very difficult. It's soft steel. Uh, the, the fact that it is a top break means that it's prone to stretching anyway. This is not a gun that survives 100 years very well. And so I doubt it was the most robust in a battlefield either. However, at that time, max, it would have to make it like three years of combat. And so if you're not just sitting there playing with it every single day, it's probably not that bad. It's still new at that time. It's still reasonable. And even despite the problems with this one, you saw May certainly would be able to defend herself with something like this. Maybe not ideally, but she could. And ergonomics not terrible, yada yada. It's an okay service pistol, and the British seem to work with it well enough. Now, that does not mean, however, that they kept it for very long. This thing was declared obsolete in 1921. And so plenty of them were kicked down to either, you know, commercial, well, private sales, uh, or a lot went into police forces. As a matter of fact, there's one notable example from Australia. That would be the New South Wales modified belly gun for plainclothes duty. This is not a very compact concealed carry. Now all of that would be the whole story for this particular gun in the war. That is, of course, if not for this, the Italian Modelo 1916. This is literally the same gun at a different caliber. Generally the same size and weight overall, but chambering the 10.4 millimeter Bodeo cartridge, this gun was actually never officially adopted by Italy, but it streamed in by the thousands as they were permitted for use by officers. Yeah, I can't find any paperwork on these actually being adopted or bought in large numbers in, you know, by the government. Instead, it looks like they were almost all private purchased by officers. Uh, I can't guarantee that though. It's just, it's hard to make a comment on a mission. Uh, I've got a lot of Italian sources, and they talk about a lot of handguns like the Beretta and the Glissanti and the 
Bodeo and Shamlo, they do not talk about this gun. They just vaguely, briefly mention it, if at all. So there's not a lot of data for me to share, except for the fact that these were available, uh, they were chambered, and they were used. So beautiful piece of history there, but luckily we have one right here for you to enjoy. True adoption was probably prevented thanks to the steady supply of Spanish-made bodegas, like we covered in an earlier episode. No sense in chasing down a different design when you could just double up on your existing one. Anyway, these guys were brought in by F. Titoni in Brescia, and given their OH marked grips, it's likely they were unmarked models made by Orbea Hermanos, trying to look like domestic production. They were chambered in the same standard service cartridge as the Bodeo, a mild 10.4 millimeter cartridge with an unusual bullet shape to maximize velocity. Service life for these guys is going to be very similar to the 455 British version. Uh, they're going to get used to the rear, although being privately purchasable, I'm sure they could just be taken anywhere. It's whatever the officer happens to get their hands on. And in some ways, I would probably like this a bit better than an unreliable Glacenti or things like that. It's a decent gun. It's not a great gun. It's a decent gun. And certainly, by the way, when we compare it to the Bodeo, well, I mean, at least we have simultaneous ejection, unlike the, you know, weird gate loady Abadie system. There's some give and take here. Some people might actually prefer this. But anyway, that aside, I want to say one thing. A lot of these may have been sold after the war commercially in Italy as well, because I've seen plenty with the exact same nickel coating. All right, so let's review. We have Smith & Wesson, who makes their little double action in 38 and 32. Teeny weeny point and clicky. Now, this sells very, very well commercially, and they release a big bore military-styled and military-marketed double and single-action revolver. This thing is fantastically cool, but nobody buys it. Instead, it ends up being copied in Spain by Orbea Hermanos, and it's sold pretty widely around the world, and certainly appreciated in Spain itself by a lot of officers. As we go into the war, the British end up desperate for more guns, and so they buy it in 455. And then Italy has the same problem, and probably Orbea Hermanos has a bunch of stock that they were planning on selling to the British that they now no longer can do. And so, boom, you end up with this, the Tetoni imported model 1916. And I'm going to take a vague guess, and I almost want to take a pair of calipers, because in my mind, I am willing to bet that some of those 6,000 overflows from the British ended up going into this. Because it's a year later, well, it's the same year even, actually, Model 16, and it just seems so identical. And also, it's very interesting how they've just sort of removed only specific marks and replaced them with other specific... I'm very curious about this, but that is a subject for another day. Now, I will say, just if anybody is curious to track this problem down, the ones returned from the British, the 6,000, generally were expected to have been sold to South America or Africa or things like that, and were generally expected to stay in their 455 chambering. We know this because Orbea Hermano specifically requested that Kainok be given dispensation to produce 455 Mark II to sell to Orbea to put with the rejected pistols so they could sell them elsewhere. There's no evidence of whether that was agreed to or not. So if it was agreed to, they would have stayed in 455. If it wasn't agreed to, then maybe they did get sort of re-cylindered. It'd be a simple operation. Hey, that's why some of you guys might want to start a new career as arms researchers, because I don't have the time. All right, let's go ahead and get May's opinion on these two six shooters. All right, once more, same as not quite before, because this is a different top break Smith & Wesson is styled 
revolver. This is a Spanish copy, and this is in double action. And I know you guys are expecting me to say they, but realistically there's no difference between the Italian model and the British 455. So we're just going to go with the 455. It handled a little better. Uh, it worked a little better. You get it in a moment. Okay. We're just going to cover this one. There's no real point in breaking them up. So just, they're both the same thing. Slightly, slightly different cartridge. Not a big deal. So, we'll give it its best bet because 455 is probably a little more fun than 10.4. True. Now, this is a double action. Smith & Wesson number three. This should be everything you dreamed of and it should tickle your most ticklish of fancies. How do you feel? All right. So, a lot of this is looking similar. What the heck is going on down here? What happened to my trigger spur? I missed that. That was so... What happened to my knuckle? What is going on here? These two things are not like the other. Like, are, they're not the same. What the heck? I missed that. Like, the trigger spur was dope. I mean, okay. So, I, I get my grip up here. And, yes, looks like they've moved the grip a little further forward and a little bit tighter in. So, I'm closer to the action. Cool. But, if I'm... On this gun, if I tighten up on the knuckle with my webbing, like, I am perfectly in there. Hold on. I'm perfectly in here so that I'm, I'm level with the gun. Like, a, this is definitely a point-shoot kind of feel. Whereas with this one, if I tighten up on the knuckle, my enemies are not birds. They are people. They're on the ground. I mean, sure, there are airplanes in the sky, but come on. I need to be able to have this straight. So you actually have to be able to adjust your grip a little bit lower which means you're not as tight on this grip as you would like to be and it does feel like it could slip a little bit. I'll get into a little bit more in the shooting section. Um, so yeah, definitely not as comfortable as the number three. I'm going to miss that. Um, so top break again. This one, not as smooth, weirdly enough, as the number three. I do kind of miss that, but it's definitely a positive grip. Like I don't feel like I'm having to put that much force behind it and it does pop open pretty easily. However, I still have this weird angle, like where I'm just, I can't pop it open right here and load them in comfortably for the rounds. I do have to kind of adjust it back to load them in. Small complaint again, but come on, you, you had a second try there. Couldn't you have done it a little better? No? Okay, cool. Whatever. But yeah, ergonomically, she's also lighter. There's not much, as much weight to her. There's not as much of a sight radius as I had before. It's not as long, so... I'm sure that's going to affect it too a little bit there, guys. But hey, whatever. Beggars can't be choosers. At the very least, hey, I've got double action now. So that should be an improvement, right? I'm going to need to get into the shooting though, I imagine. But otherwise, ergonomics, she's got a few complications now, I think. However, I will say they did do one thing right on this grip. They lengthened it a little bit. Go Brits for requesting that. Nice. I actually do have a full finger grip. Because having to scooch down, that is something you would normally have to worry about. Like for me, with my tiny hands, it just barely would fit without that. But I'm sure someone like Othias or any other guy with decent sized hands, they'd be hanging off the end of it. So nice job for adding that extra little length there. I, I really do appreciate that. But yeah, ergonomically, I miss a little bit of that old number three with the trigger spur and the, the knuckle here on the back. But I will say it is lighter and it, I am really right here, nice tight on the action, so I imagine that's going to make some single action work a little bit easier. So I do appreciate that. So it's kind of some pros and some cons to the ergonomics on this one. Yeah, uh, I, May's right. Uh, the, the extension is very important. For my particular grip, I'd be a little lost without it. It just, just ever so slightly wouldn't be perfect. And I do have decently sized hands. Uh... That is the one thing, May's the right height for the war, mm -hmm. but her indecently sized hands has let her get away with a lot of things the rest of us wouldn't be able to. Indecent. So, uh, we have a double action Smith & Wesson. We have some grip improvements in that we are much tighter into the action. We are sort of less extended out to the rear. It probably improved balance, except for the fact that you've lost your trigger spur that you love. And my knuckle. Don't forget the original design of this gun had a inset here behind the trigger so you could really get up in there. That was definitely their goal, was to move the hand up and into the gun tighter. With a narrower overall grip, this was meant for more control. And like I said, this grip stays around into the K-Frame series, although we know May prefers the bell shape more than this anyway. But... This was the future for at least a while. Now, overall handling feels fairly good, except I agree with her. 
you just end up choking up a little too high on this gun and you have to choke her back down. That being said, maybe we'll see some real improvements because of the ability, because the only DQ for the number three was not having double action. So this does have double action. Is that enough to finally make this sort of work for you? Talk about shooting this gun. Let's see where our pros and cons there. So, shooting. Again, top break, already covered that. Lining up my sights. These Spanish made like light steel sights, they have gotten dinged up over the years, so they're actually slightly worse than they were before. So they're just standard Smith & Wesson sights, they weren't great to begin with, so now being dinged up, they're actually worse. They're probably not straight, they are a little bit crooked, so good luck aiming with these guys, that's a fun hoot. Anyway, uh, going to pull for single action. Nice, easy, I'm right here tight on the action, I don't feel that difficult at all, pull the trigger. Single action is still really smooth, nice and crisp, still loving it. Then I go to pull for double. That's where we went into some problems because guys, we had three Spanish made guns on range, all different calibers. This one worked the best and it was still, ter it was still wasn't great. Like it still took us several cycles through in order to actually get all the rounds to go off just because the tolerance on this guy is not great. I mean, look at this. Like, can you hear that? That is terrible. This is why you don't see any top breaks today because it is a terrible design. It is a flaw that it, it you just can't overcome that. So honestly, it wasn't really a lot of fun shooting this one because it was just so difficult to try to be able to get all six rounds in it to go off without any sort of loping or the expansion of the cartridges causing some problems as far as smoothness. It, it really was difficult to get this guy to run. And then not only that, but every time I pulled the trigger, I had to readjust my grip on this gun, no matter single or double, like because there is a loss of a knuckle here, it always slipped in my grip. So I was constantly, and you can see it in the shooting segment where I'm constantly having to readjust my grip every single shot. And that's annoying and that's costly. And especially single handing these, I can't imagine anyone doing that quickly. Like it just, there's no way to do that quickly. So me personally, the recoil may have been mild and the single action trigger may have been nice. And yeah, the hammer pulling back was actually pretty smooth. That wasn't bad. Everything else coupled with it, it, it really wasn't the easiest shooter, but it did go off, it did go bang, and we did get a lot of rounds down range. It just, I wish it could have done a little bit better in terms of performance. Yeah, I actually wanted to do this episode a while back, and we've had a lot of trouble with sourcing reliable revolvers. I mean, we have some here and other calibers and other configurations that we can get to go bang, one and six, three and six, whatever. Uh, they're not dangerous necessarily, although some of them are. There's DQ'd guns in here that we would not fire. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we found these in 11 millimeter. We found them in Bodeo. We found them in 455. We found them, you know, there's, there's versions of these guns all over the place. I've got one in here in 455 that is so worn out that there's no way. No. I mean, absolutely unsafe to fire. Um, and there's ways to check these guns. Maybe we'll get Mark to do a revolver episode. That might be nice for how yeah. to inspect a revolver. But, um... Even when they ran, even when they were safe, even when they locked up correctly, when they fired, one of the number one problems I saw in this system, just like May demonstrated, is that after 100 years of soft Spanish steel, and I'll put that right on my mic, and hopefully that comes through, uh, they're just, they're walked out. And so, yes, by the way, she has a German-made number three, and if I take that gun, there's not, there's not a sound. No, it is just, it's locked in there tight. Now, this gun's has, you know, 100 years of use, at least. I mean, it's older than the Spanish one by two decades, probably. Mm -hmm. But it's better made, better steel, better quality control. Uh, and even if this gun fitted as well as the German-made Russian contract, the day it was made, over time, this is going to wear and flex because it's just not the same quality of construction. Now... This is where we have to sort of play in our imaginations because we can't properly assess this gun for World War I because we don't know of one and haven't found one in mint enough condition 
Because again, these things were sold off surplus right away, 1921 for Britain and a lot of other countries, they were never really included in the inventory. Most of these have been used pretty roughly because they were bought cheaply in the 20s. Mm -hmm. So finding one in mint condition hasn't been a high priority and we're going to have to just stop and pretend. We're gonna have to go, what if this flex wasn't there? What if that drag on the cylinder wasn't there when we were firing? What if she wasn't tying up and making that weird hump in the trigger? Because if we do this dry and then double, it's actually it's quite smooth. smooth. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, it feels fine. It feels very impressive, actually. It's once ammo is brought into play, it all goes out the window. The first shot, by the way, always feels good, too, because there's oh, nothing yeah. expanding and pushing around in there or shaking it up. But after that first shot, you're just you're spending a death sentence on it almost. Good luck getting all six to go off. So here we are in the 2000s. I would not defend myself with this gun. But we have to ask the question. If May pretends that this gun was tight and therefore can assume that the dry fire sensation is the sensation she had on range, would you use something like this in battle? Recalling, by the way, that the perfect Smith & Wesson number 3 with its single action only was not reliable enough for you. Well, not, not reliable enough, but not fast enough. So... Is it worth it to have a crappy, crappy, in quotes, it's not actually crappy at the day it was made probably, but a crappy Spanish-made top break or a beautifully machined German or American-made top break or even Russian-made top break at one point, but one's double, one single, does that make the difference? You know, I do think it makes a difference. If I'm in imagination land where it's 100 years ago when they're just being made, take away... All the stuff I talked about before in terms of the wear issues that I was having with it, then my only issues left are the sights are not the best and the grip here is not the best thanks to the fact that the knuckle is not as prominent as it was before. That's it. The rest of it is actually pretty good. It's a decent cartridge, smooth single double, uh, theoretically. A good hammer, nice smooth pullback, you know, again, theoretically. And I mean, the top break at that time isn't going to be a problem at that time when it was first done. It's only going to be a problem now, today. So honestly, I do have to give it a, like a good theoretical yes, because like I said, my only problem with the number three was the fact that it was single action. Uh, otherwise, I loved it. But if I'm not doing theoretical, like this one, this specific one, no, I wouldn't take this one into battle. You know, this would be terrible because this one has so many wear issues. But minus the wear issues, yeah, it actually would be a decent revolver for the war. So uh, theoretical, solid, yeah. I actually hate to agree on this one. Thank you. Because this is not my favorite grip. Uh, reasonably, a lot of people have written very well about these grips. There's people to this day that love this grip because, again, this was a K-frame grip as well. Personally, I don't care for it much. However, she is correct. Doctrinally, this is a much easier gun to wield than even the best of the Smith & Wesson single actions. And the downsides of this gun is that the grip isn't quite as good as the original Smith & Wesson single action in terms of the knuckle placement, but it's better in terms of being compact and tighter up to the action and easier to control the gun. So, sort of a nullification there, not better or worse on the whole average. The sights are the same, not the best sights, so again, nullification there. That means that it has a solid improvement over the single action and that it does have double action. And so... I still miss my spur. Yeah, and, and the interesting thing is, even with the wear in this gun, assuming that every cartridge went bang, assuming it's not so worn out that we're getting light strikes, to this day, 100 years later, if you had two people coming at you at 30 feet, this is still better than the single action unless you're specifically trained on single action. Yeah, technically that one would be better for multiple attackers and for 30 feet, it would do perfectly fine. Yeah, it's not gonna be super slick, it's gonna be a pain, it's not gonna be the most accurate, but you're probably gonna be able to hit a human-sized target at close range multiple times with this gun easier than this one despite the clear problems in its age and wear and blah, 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 blah. So, as much as you want to favor the better made artisan gun, this thing works. So the purchase from the Spanish, not insane. What was insane or would be insane is if they had kept buying them after all the DQs they had. On inspection, too many of them were something akin to this wiggle wobble the day they came in. Now, 
maybe the Italian versions, because I haven't, I have no way of going back and checking those mints, and I have no record of an inspection process, they might have had some problems right from day one. I can't say right now. But the British ones, we know that they were inspected because they failed so many of them. They were stringent. They were watching for this problem. So if you got a British one at the time, I think you'd be pretty safe. All right, so that'll wrap us up. Stay after the credits if you'd like to learn anything uh, as far as the updates, because we filmed these ahead, so I don't even know what they would be. Um, and other than that, we just thank you guys for tuning in and hope you're enjoying it. Bye, everybody. All right, everyone, I'm going to be very honest with you. For about the past six months, we've seen slow but sustained growth. And I've sort of been waiting to see if there's any more room for a breakout in terms of appeal for the show. Now, as part of that, though, I am happy to say that we have reached over 90,000 subscribers on YouTube. That means we're very close to cracking 100,000, six figures. This seems like a big round number, and so I'd like to stretch for it. So if you know anybody who would enjoy the show, who's not currently watching it or subscribed, maybe this is the time to recommend it to them. See if we can't get a little push this time around, instead of that slow, even grind. Other than that, things are going just fine. Thank you all for the support, especially over the holidays, all the posters out there, things like that. And in addition, our regular patrons, although I'm usually in more direct communication with you guys, I hope you're still enjoying the product as we move our way through the rest of the war.